what would happen if every human being on Earth disappeared. This isn't the story of how we might vanish. It is the story of what happens to the world we leave behind. In this episode of Life After People, the fate of man's great attempts at immortality. There are the bodies that are left behind, some mummified, others cryonically frozen. Will any of them truly achieve immortality? Or will they be outlived by other memorials to mankind? This is just part of a journey that will take us to the future of once crowded cities, as well as haunting sites already devoid of man. Welcome to Earth, population zero. humans to maintain them, power plants across the world start shutting down. Lights go out. Clocks stop, but the race is on to see who or what can survive the longest in the hostile world of a life after people. Around the world, the mummies of many of Egypt's pharaohs lie not in tombs deep inside pyramids, but beneath the plexiglass of modern museums. One day after people, the electronic temperature and humidity controls that mimic the cool, dry environment where the mummies once resided shut down. The bodies that have been left in the tombs in Egypt have lasted 3,000 years or more. If the conditions are just perfect for the body, I can't see why it couldn't last another 3,000 years. But if the conditions at the museum fail, the body would start to decay immediately. You have a high humidity, you have mold spores in the air at all times, so they would first probably be attacked by mold and bacteria. How long can these mummies last? We shall see. One month after people, more than 100 bodies kept in suspended animation at the world's cryonics facilities are still in a deep freeze. According to experts, even a month-long power outage won't cause the bodies to thaw. They are kept at a temperature of minus 320 degrees Fahrenheit by liquid nitrogen, which doesn't rely on electricity to maintain its rigid temperature. But there's a problem. Liquid nitrogen boils off slowly. In the time of humans, the supply had to be replenished every few weeks. With no one left to restock the crucial refrigerant, the bodies begin to warm up. Once they reach minus 184 degrees Fahrenheit, chemical reactions resume, and the natural processes of decomposition take over. In the cells are enzymes and fluids. These break down quickly. The cell wall is broken down by enzymes. They leak out. As soon as the temperature started to go up, the body would just accelerate in the decaying process. For these human beings, the bid for immortality is coming to an end. And should some future intelligence wish to recreate humanity, they will find no help in the laboratories left behind by man. There are approximately 400,000 human embryos currently frozen in clinics in the United States alone. 
they, along with all the egg and sperm samples in the world, quickly decay as their supplies of liquid nitrogen run out. Man's DNA still has a chance for survival. 200 miles above the Earth, up in the International Space Station, rests a computer disk called the Immortality Drive. Delivered into orbit in October 2008, the Immortality Drive contains the digitized DNA information of a highly eclectic group, including physicist Stephen Hawking, comedian Stephen Colbert, and Playboy model Joe Garcia. It's the brainchild of Richard Garriott, a video game producer from Houston, who hoped alien beings might someday use the DNA data to reconstruct an extinct humanity. The immortality drive may be man's best shot at preserving the species in a life after people. But we will see if it can really last forever. Art was another way for man to achieve immortality, creating images that would last through the ages. But many masterpieces require protection in controlled environments. In the time of humans, Michelangelo's magnificent frescoes on the ceiling of the Vatican Sistine Chapel were protected by more than 20 miles of pipes, pumps, valves and wiring. To prevent the fresco plaster from absorbing too much water from the air, the humidity was kept at between 50 and 60 percent. Air filters removed even microscopic particles of dust. It was all controlled by computer. But without electricity, the system has closed down forever. But three months after people, the disappearance of humans is actually helping the frescoes. Without the annual press of two million tourists, there are no ascending currents of human body heat. The figures painted on the ceiling, including God and Adam, are safe, at least for now. six months after people. While nature is attacking some of the bodies and structures left behind, she preserves others. In the barren wastes of Ross Island in Antarctica, there are huts that were used in the early 1900s by the explorers Robert Scott and Ernest Shackleton. Here, with an average temperature of three below zero, the ravages of decay have been slowed. Inside and out, the huts remain frozen in time. With the severe cold in Antarctica, a lot of the insects that would gnaw away at the wood structure uh, don't exist there. And the fungus, the mold, doesn't exist there. Cans of beef from 1917 sit on the shelves. These cans, they'll last two, three more centuries easily. Meat still hangs on metal hooks, appearing quite edible, even after almost a century. In some cases, extreme cold has preserved flesh for thousands of years. In the 1928 Explorers Club meeting in Paris, they ate mastodon. Some mastodon came up through the ice, and they got it, and they cooked it up, and they served it at the dinner. And I had a friend there, and I asked him, I said, how did it taste? 
And he said, well, it tasted a lot like rotten meat. But it's been buried in the ice for 10,000 years, and, uh, and it would. But it's edible. While Antarctic cold will preserve the explorer's huts for many years, it's the more temperate parts of the globe that most of mankind called home. Cities like Houston and Boston, where the artifacts of man face a much harsher fate. In Boston Harbor sits one of the most storied ships in American history. The USS Constitution, first launched in 1797, is the world's oldest commissioned warship still afloat. During the War of 1812, cannonballs were seen bouncing off the ship's 25-inch thick wooden hull, earning her the nickname Old Ironsides. But even Old Ironsides is defenseless in this race to survive, along with most of what man has built. Nine months after people, the race to see what survives is becoming more intense. In Boston, a military relic is about to lose its final battle. The hull of old Ironsides may be tough enough to repel a cannonball, but it can't withstand the constant infiltration of water. Wooden ships leak. The wood starts leaking almost immediately. The wood will shrink, the wood will expand, wood will rot. In the time of humans, automatic bilge pumps drained 900 gallons of water a day from the ship. But those pumps stopped months ago. This flooding alone won't be enough to drag the ship underwater. It will take the Boston winter to finally do what enemy warships never could. The waves might wash over the deck and might force it further under. In a world without people, maybe the Constitution would remain afloat for a year, maybe less. years after people. The International Space Station still orbits above the Earth. But without constant recalibration from terrestrial stations or boosts from space shuttles, the ISS loses two miles of altitude each month. As it drops from its original height of 200 miles to below 160 miles, the orbital decline accelerates until it re-enters the atmosphere, where air and friction join with gravity, and the space station burns. Incinerated in the descent, perhaps the final hope of reconstructing the human species. The digitized DNA of the immortality drive proves to be quite mortal after all. Five years into a life after people. Weeds transform the historic streets of Boston. If you just leave the gutters and rain spouts not maintained, plants will take root in little cracks in the brick and little cracks in the mortar. They now attack Boston's Old North Church. This is where lanterns warned Paul Revere of a British invasion. 
Now, the natural world has invaded and conquered. If the windows blow out, you'll have rain coming in, you'll have pigeons coming in, you'll have animals coming in. You'll also have vines starting to grow or the maple tree sending its shoots in here. They'll sprout up in the rotting wood. Twenty years after people, nature conquers the subtropical city of Houston in a different way. The tallest building in Texas now looms over a city that is slowly reverting back to the swamp it once was. Once kept at a steady 72 degrees, Houston's great domed sports stadiums now swelter to 125 degrees in the summer. They have become enormous bat caves. The artificial grass of the Astrodome's trademark AstroTurf is swallowed up by reeds and muck. Feasting on insects, the bats make their own contribution to the new ecosystem. Their excrement, or guano. Guano has a lot of nutrients in it. And so what you have is you'll have insects that feed on fungus, bringing in predators that eat on those insects that eat the fungus. Twenty-five years without people have not been kind to the mummies housed in the world's great museums. With no one around to regulate heat and humidity, mold struck first, then insects. Mites would probably be the first insect you would see destroying a mummified body. After the mites eat the decayed body, it would start to break down uh, the fibers um, it would start to turn into dust. Great kings like Ramses II and Tutankhamun are now reduced to skeletons. In the 20th century, some embalmers tried for a more lifelike presentation. The corpse of Lenin was preserved for decades in Moscow. The process was a state secret, but it was rumored to have involved repeated baths in formaldehyde, ethanol, and methanol. Russian experts were always on duty to protect Lenin's body, scrubbing away bacteria, closing up openings in the flesh, and lightening blemishes. His body is treated with makeup so that he appears like he did 30 years ago. But the process of decay underneath that makeup and underneath that wax is still taking place. It can be slowed down, but the process of decay never stops. With no people to tend to it, Lenin's body goes the way of the rotting pharaohs. Thirty-five years after people, the wooden steeple of Boston's 18th century Old North Church is on the verge of collapse. The steeple, being taller, is going to be more susceptible to a big storm than the rest of the building. It would fall sooner. The once guiding light of the American Revolution has been extinguished. 35 years after people is long enough to turn coastal cities like Boston into ghostly wrecks. 
How do we know this? It's a future that has already happened in a place nearly 7,000 miles from Boston. This island was the most densely populated place on Earth until man disappeared. Thirty-five years after people, our homes, offices, and factories are cracking and sagging as nature executes its hostile takeover. This is a future that has already come to pass in one remote corner of the world. Several miles off Japan's southwestern coast, a forsaken island stands lifeless and decaying. This island, as you can see, is uh, a slab of concrete sitting in the middle of the ocean with high-rise buildings sprouting from it. Completely empty, no one living here anymore. No electricity, no vegetation, nothing. It's called Hashima Island, once a thriving coal mining town and home to thousands of people. Now, its abandoned offices and apartment buildings are literally exploding under nature's relentless hands. The island has been left literally to the elements all these years, exposed completely. And the wind is carrying all the seawater up into the buildings. The degradation is just startling and uh, remarkable. Because of the unsafe conditions, Hashima is strictly off limits to visitors. Beginning in the 1890s, Japan's Mitsubishi company mined coal from the seafloor beneath Hashima. At its peak in 1959, the 15-acre island was home to more than 5,000 workers and their families. The highest recorded population density on Earth. In 1974, as Japan began favoring petroleum over coal, Mitsubishi closed the mine and relocated the entire population to the mainland. 35 years later, nothing remains but decayed buildings and ghostly memories. What does the city look like after all the people are gone? This is the Hashima version of life after people. This isn't a war zone. It was one of the busiest thoroughfares on the island. There was once a, a row of stores along here with wooden shutters. All of the lumber has collapsed onto the ground. The concrete walling has fallen. The metal netting is strewn along the ground. It's the effects of 35 years of wind and rain. Once one of the busiest places on the island, now it's just completely silent. These rooms once echoed with the laughter of children playing. Now, all that remains are the corroded, rusty remnants of their toys. Overgrown and forgotten, the school playground is now rusted scrap metal. Hashima is a laboratory for showing what happens to reinforce concrete in a savage environment. Every year, the typhoon season delivers rain and winds of up to 100 miles per hour, while huge ocean waves smash directly into buildings. In the case of this building, we have an iron frame and steel reinforced parts. 
As you can see, the front part of this pillar is damaged, while the backside isn't. It tells you that the surface is damaged by salt water, wind, and rain. Scientific studies of concrete core samples revealed that the buildings most exposed to the ocean had a salt content 15 times greater than the others. The concrete buildings themselves gave the island a warlike profile and even a new nickname, Battleship Island. Hashimoto is called Battleship Island because from a distance, it literally looks like the shape of a battleship. The similarity is so uncanny, in fact, that it was actually torpedoed during World War II by American submarines. Dotoku Sakamoto lived on the island as a young boy. His former home is on the ninth floor of a building that once housed 300 families in tiny apartments. This was our room that we used until 1974. There were five family members living in this house. And there was my private room and a balcony over there. The wooden facades and balconies were quickly destroyed. The many passageways and stairs that connected the buildings are now falling apart. This is the Jigo Kudan, the Steps of Hell, so named because they're so steep. The buildings of Hashima uh, are high rises of up to nine stories in height. And so people living on the island had to negotiate stairs like this on a daily basis. There wasn't a single uh, elevator or escalator uh, anywhere on the island, so you can see uh, where the name comes from. Originally, Hashimo was just a bare rock without any vegetation sitting in the middle of the ocean. And by artificial means, it was turned into a human community. But in reality, it's just that, a bare rock uh, sitting in the middle of the ocean and lifeless, and it's gone back to lifelessness. The breathtaking destruction of Hashima Island in just 35 years without people shows that mankind's many bids for immortality face very long odds. Even our great monuments of iron, steel, and stone will be under attack 50 years after people. But could some human remains actually beat the odds? It's been 50 years since the last human voices echoed through the streets, alleys, and hallways of planet Earth. But the words of man aren't quite silenced yet. Tens of thousands of domestic parrots escaped into the wild after humans disappeared and still retain the words taught to them by their vanished masters. Parrots are considered one of the smartest creatures on Earth now, up with uh, great apes and dolphins. Some parrots have learned several hundred words and might keep that vocabulary even without humans to interact with. 
a companion parrot that escaped into the wild it might have a lifespan, say, of 60 years, then it'd be very plausible that 50 years later you could still hear human noises in the wild. Hello. So for now, some of the words of mankind will survive. Hello. Seventy-five years after people, time and nature are wearing away Boston's monumental Bunker Hill Bridge. The steel and concrete span is held up by 116 steel cables strung from two towers. It's really painting the steel, making sure no corrosion exists, sweeping the debris off the bridge, cleaning out the drainage structures so plants don't grow and the water flows off of the bridge, and sealing the concrete with a moisture penetrating sealer. To keep moisture away from the cables, they are surrounded by plastic piping. This also protects them from another source of corrosion. Bird droppings are amazingly corrosive to a wide range of building materials. It wasn't even fully recognized 20 or 30 years ago. The waste product of pigeons and starlings contains high levels of ammonia and salt. Mixed with rainwater, the combination triggers a lethal electrochemical reaction. 20 years of bird droppings penetrating the steel of the eight-lane 35W bridge in Minneapolis contributed to its fatal collapse in 2007. After a century, weather and stress have cracked the protective plastic coating on the cables of the Bunker Hill Bridge. Storm water, some of it mixed with acidic pigeon droppings, has penetrated to corrode the steel. One by one, cables fail. When half the cables go, those that remain cannot support the weight of the roadway. Down the coast in New York, more than 200 years after she was given as a gift of friendship, from the people of France to the people of America, the Statue of Liberty still holds her torch high. This is actually the second torch to be held aloft by Lady Liberty. The first was replaced in the 1980s during a massive restoration project. Now, beneath her copper skin, only as thick as two pennies, her skeleton is beginning to fail. The steel straps that hold the copper to the steel framework uh, would pull away, the rivets would pull away, uh, over a period of 100 to 200 years. Her end is not yet here, but without humans, it is inevitable. In Houston, the domed stadiums have spent 100 years as subtropical paradises. In the time of humans, it cost an estimated $500,000 per year to maintain the Astrodome, the first domed baseball stadium in the world. After a century of neglect, the entire structure is cracking and crumbling. Finally, in great chunks, the 9,000-ton steel and lucite dome comes raining down. <laughs> 150 years after people leaves Boston looking like an overgrown garden. In the time of humans, the best observation point in the city was from the top of the 60-story John Hancock Tower, the tallest building in New England. 
sense. But the notorious New England weather has now destroyed the building's outer skin. Corroding steel columns lead to a pancake collapse. The urban jungle is now just jungle. But former cities still echo with familiar words. Although these parrots have never interacted with humans, their ancestors did, and some remnants of human speech have been passed down to them. But our languages will not be immortal. While parrots can pass on human words to their chicks, it has no value for the survival of the species. I would think the drop-off would be more than 90% per generation, 200 years after the last human, who would be highly unlikely to expect to hear human vocalization and parrots in the wild. Over 200 years, the tallest building in Texas has had its windows blown out by hurricanes and its insides corroded by rain. You have to expect a hurricane in Houston, a good one, a big one, every four or five years. That's going to create a significant amount of damage to almost any tall building. Now, the accumulated force of nature will strip the building to its bones. The steel frame might still be there 200 years later. The rest of the building is gone. Then, the steel frame itself will corrode and collapse. Sixteen hundred miles away in New York Harbor, the torch of liberty's best hope for immortality might lie beneath the waves. Three hundred years after people, Lady Liberty suffers a fatal relapse of an old complaint, galvanic corrosion. Her torch-bearing right arm is the first to fall. Then, other parts. But here, on the ocean floor, these shattered symbols of hope may become the fossils of the future. The hand with a torch would, by that initial ballistic trajectory, embed itself maybe up to half a meter into the mud. And that impression may well stay, uh, just in the way that footprints are preserved in mud and sand. While one icon of humanity makes a bid for immortality on the ocean floor, the most famous ceiling in the world is barely hanging on. Five hundred years after people, Michelangelo's frescoes still look down from the Sistine ceiling where they cover 12,000 square feet of surface. Even though all the frescoes have faded and cracked from changing temperature and humidity, on the wall depicting the Last Judgment, Michelangelo's heavenly sky has faded faster than other sections. The ultramarine pigment comes from lapis lazuli, mined in Tunisia. It was the most precious color in Renaissance art but also one of the most delicate. The blue color comes from three sulfur atoms and an electron, protected by aluminum and silicon atoms. High humidity breaks apart the structure, 
allowing oxygen to mix with the sulfur, turning the blue to a yellowish gray. Throughout its history, people have tried to clean the frescoes and shore up the chapel itself. But after five centuries, the last judgment has come. The walls would weaken. The vault of the roof would push the walls apart. Exterior bracing buttresses fail, initiating a chain reaction. The walls would collapse. They'd open like a book. The Sistine ceiling would not be there a 1,000 years from now without people. Probably would not be there 500 years from now. Ten thousand years after people, almost all traces of human culture are buried beneath vegetation and sand. Ten thousand years from now, there would certainly be some things that you would see, pyramids of Egypt, perhaps, but very, very little of human existence would actually be recognizable in the absence of humans. The planet has gotten warmer even in the coldest places on Earth. Even in these areas where Scott and Shackleton built their huts, we may well start to see an increase in plant life, possibly even insects, organisms that would begin to increase the rate at which decay would take away those structures. In 10,000 years, it's improbable that those huts will still be there. In 10,000 years, the Earth itself will have buried most of man's cities. One hundred million years after people, dreaming of immortality, man tried to make his mark on the world. But those marks have been erased. In the end, what survives is not what people made, but the simple mineral compounds they were made of. We possess robust bones made out of calcium phosphate. It's as durable as the bones of dinosaurs. Our teeth are even more durable. Uh, the, the dentine, and particularly the enamel, very hard to break down. So those parts of us will likely survive here and there. This is the final fate of human bodies. Along with the bridges they stretched across rivers and the buildings they piled up to the sky, art and architecture, aspiration and achievement, all just fragments on the ground in a life after people.